Thanks so much for the invitation. So uh, I'm going to be talking about pointwise ergodic theory, um, beginning with Bourgain or maybe even Burkhoff and uh, continuing through uh, recent work that we've done since COVID. So box appearing there. Can, can you repeal, remove that? Oh, uh, reopen right, PD. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, give me a second here. Uh, is that better? Yeah, no, it okay. is. Okay. Great. So please stop me if you have questions. Uh, this the stuff is it's it's basically state of the art. So I, I, it took me, in some sense, nine years to put together uh, the stuff I'll be talking about. I find it really challenging. So please stop me uh, if I'm unclear, if there's something you want me to go over. Um, so I'm going to begin this talk with just some basics about ergodic theory or sort of how I see the field. So I'm going to start a little bit informally. So just sort of imagine that X is a set. You know, you can think about it as you, you can give it a... Well, I'll be giving it structure momentarily, but imagine you have a set and some type of map from the set to itself that in some way preserves size. Uh, so the basic question that ergodic theory seeks to understand is to the extent, the extent to which in the orbit of a given point inside of your set sort of equidistributes as you keep applying uh, your map to it. So I'm, a, I'm gonna impose structure on, on my set X in a second so that we can rigorously talk about equidistribution. But that's sort of the basic, the basic type of problem. So I'm going to begin with the two examples of pointwise ergodic theory or ergodic theory that I learned at the beginning of grad school, um, which really got me interested in the field. So the first example I'm going to talk about is the case of the torus with the irrational rotation. Um, and the conclusion is that I'm going to focus on the second slide. If I start at any, if I have a continuous function, then for every single physical location X that I start with, I can recover the integral, the space average of my function using this dynamical process. So I pick X and I rotate by alpha, then I evaluate. Then I rotate by alpha again, and I evaluate and so forth. I do this N times and I take an average. And this average of, of samples, uh, converges to uh, my integral uh, as time prog progresses. So the second example uh, comes from a problem in chapter six of Eli Stein and Shikarchi's real analysis uh, textbook. And this is in fact the problem that, that got me interested in ergodic theory or this example. So again, let's let X denote the unit interval. Uh, this time T is gonna be the doubling map. And the conclusion is that for almost every X inside of this interval, uh, if I keep iterating X, if I keep doubling X and evaluate it in the unit interval or the, the first half of the interval, this converges to the measure of the interval uh, as, as time, time progresses. And the reason why we care about this is that if we express X in its binary expansion, um, I'll say that the, the limit of these ENs has to be zero. Um, to avoid round off errors, then the statement that Tn x is in the unit interval is equivalent to the statement that the n plus first bit is zero. So let's investigate this. Uh, if if x is in the unit inter the first interval, then e one is zero. If I double x, then I shift everything by two. E one over two becomes e one, which is zero mod one. E2 over 2 squared becomes E2 over 2. So Tx is in the unit interval if E2 over 2 is 0. In other words, if E2 is 0, and so forth. And the conclusion that for almost every x, uh, the percentage of time that your, your doubled x lies in the unit interval is a half. This is equivalent to the statement that uh, x is normal that if you look at its binary expansion, uh, half of the, the bits are, are one, half the bits are zero asymptotically. And the reason why I, I like this so much is I when I started grad school, I sort of thought I was interested in number theory. 
And this was the first example uh, of what I considered a number theoretic property uh, that I could prove using analytic methods. And I thought this was incredibly cool. Um, you now this example extends, you can replace the, you know, the, the doubling map with the tripling map and considering things in the ternary expansion and so forth. Uh, so I'm gonna now switch gears and talk, talk a little bit about the more general setting. So for the rest of this talk, X mu T will be a probability space with an invertible measure preserving transformation. And I'm gonna use the ergodic theoretic notation um, from now on, the function TNF will be the function that picks a physical location, applies the transformation T n times, and then evaluates. So the previous two examples, in the first example, T was an irrational rotation, X was the torus. In the second example, T was the doubling map, X was again the torus. And we, view, we can view our, our Cesaro averages in this capacity. So broadly, I, I consider ergodic theory to be the study of the dynamics of a function defined on one of these probability spaces under the action of, of these measure-preserving transformations. And the classical objects that we consider are the Cesaro averages, just as we've seen in these examples. Um, and the, the question that we're interested in is the extent to which, if any, we can make sense of these limiting values. Um, so you can ask this question in a variety of contexts, but for the rest of this talk, I'm really going to focus on the Hilbert space setting. So you can think about every function as being square integrable until I say otherwise. So there are two types of convergence that can be considered. So the first type of norm convergence, where you view these Cesaro averages as sequences of vectors, you know, that's each for every L2 function, the Cesaro average stays in L2. So you get, a, as, n, as n increases, you, you arrive at a sequence of vectors uh, and you ask to what extent you can make sense of these vectors from this vectorial standpoint. In other words, if I sort of squint at these averages in an L2 sense, can I detect some type of limiting behavior? And the type of convergence that I'm gonna focus on today is, uh, is pointwise convergence in which you pick a physical location in your space X you evaluate all the CNFs, all the Cesaro averages at that point, and you see to what extent, if any, you can, you can detect a limiting behavior of those sequence of numbers at that point. Does that make sense? So in the first example, we're sort of squinting at our, at our Cesaro averages. In the second example, we're, we're investigating uh, sequences of numbers as we vary physical location. So the two classical ergodic theorems due to von Neumann and Birkhoff dictate that these Cesaro averages converge both in norm uh, and pointwise for integrable functions. Or, sorry, for square integrable functions and integrable ones. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about norm convergence, uh, which is very, very well understood in the case of, of linear function or uh, linear averages. Um, so for, for example, uh, if you use the spectral theorem and a little bit of Cauchy-Schwartz, uh, you can prove that for any polynomial with integer coefficients, uh, these Cesaro averages uh, converge, uh, converge in norm, regardless of what polynomial this is. So we understand polynomial orbits, uh, norm limits of polynomial orbits pretty well. And for this, you know, you use the spectral theorem and what's known as vial differencing. Uh, but this is highly related to the study of exponential sums. And this will be a major theme throughout this talk. Um, but once we switch from a single average to multiple averages, um, problems get much, much harder. And the motivating example uh, is Samaretti's theorem, which was addressed using ergodic theory, uh, ergodic theoretic methods by Furstenberg. So I'll present a, uh, the Samaretti theorem, and then I'll recast it using the language of, of ergodic theory. So the statement is that for any subset of the integers that's somewhat large in the sense that I can find some increasing sequence of intervals so that my relative density inside of these intervals stays bounded away from zero, then the conclusion is that for, for any k, at least two, I can find infinitely many progressions of, of, length, uh, of length k. Uh, where n is non-zero. Uh, 
And in the K equals two case, which concerns three APs was first due to runoff. Um, so what does this mean? For, for, for instance, if I, if I choose E to be, uh, you know, QZ, a coset for some very, very large Q, well, my density inside of an interval is gonna be one over Q. Uh, and the conclusion is that I can find infinitely many arithmetic regressions inside of this coset. And this is sort of, this is unsurprising. You can do this by hand, but the conclusion is that if you have any set that sort of looks like one over or QZ from the perspective of density, then the same phenomena holds. Moreover, you don't have to look like QZ everywhere. You only have to look like QZ from the perspective of density inside of some increasing sequence of intervals. So using his correspondence principle, uh, Furstenberg deduced Samaretti's theorem from a dynamical systems result, which is slightly weaker, but not much weaker than the below formulation of host Kra and Leibniz. So here's the statement. So for any non-trivial, so non-zero bounded function, and any k at least one, uh, if I look at these multilinear averages, then they converge to a non-zero functions when I view them as vectors. So what's happening here is f is bounded. So this product is bounded. So this average is bounded. So for every n, I get a bounded function. Since I'm on a probability space, every bounded function is square integrable. So I have a sequence of vectors. I squint at them all. And I can deduce some type of limiting behavior in this sort of squinty vectorial sense. Moreover, this limit is non-trivial whenever my initial data is non-trivial. So when you go from, it, it took a lot of effort to go from uh, the Semiretti situation of, of linear averages or averages along arithmetic progressions uh, to averages along polynomial progressions. So the departure point for this line of inquiry uh, was due to Furstenberg Weiss in, in 96. So, you know, 20 years after Furstenberg. Uh, and the statement is that whenever F and G are bounded, the sequence of bilinear averages, nonlinear bilinear averages, uh, converge in the L2 norm. So again, I take two bounded functions, I form their product, I form their average, it stays bounded in L infinity, so it's an L2 vector. I view all of these bounded functions from this vectorial standpoint, and I can deduce that there's some vector, some L2 vector, to which these averages converge in this vectorial sense. And sort of analogous to the Samaretti theorem, uh, there's there's a sort of a, a Ramsey theoretic consequence that you can deduce. So again, suppose you have a subset of positive upper density. So I have a relatively large subset. The conclusion is there exist infinitely many progressions x x minus n x minus n squared, where n is non-zero. Now you can if you sort of push Semiretti and Furstenberg Weiss to its natural extension. Uh, you arrive at Miguel Walsh's sort of optimal uh, norm convergence result. So he, what he proves is that for any collection of transformations that generate a nil potent group, so there's some commuting vestigial amount of, of commuting behavior, but not much. And any polynomial orbits, uh, for any collection of bounded functions, these multilinear ergodic averages converge in norm. And the reason why this is optimal is that if I replace nil potent with solvable, uh, this conclusion in general fails. So for instance, if all of the P's are linear and all the T's are the same, this gives you, this is, this is sort of the Samaretti theorem. When all the T's are the same and we're in the bilinear setting, P1 is N, P2 is N squared. We're in the setting of first invert vice. But Walsh said that the conclusion of Furstenberg Weiss holds in, in this generality. So this is sort of an optimal result in the category of norm convergence. Now I'm going to switch gears and talk about the pointwise setting. So up until COVID, uh, the state of the art uh, pointwise convergence result for bilinear averages uh, was, was, a set, was due to Bourgain and, and later strengthened by Michael Lacey. So the statement is this, it's really rather surprising. Uh, suppose I take some, uh, uh, well, I guess not non-zero, non-one integer. So don't, k is, k is not allowed to be zero, k is not allowed to be one. Uh, 
then the conclusion is that whenever f and g uh, are just slightly better than integrable and their product is not an L two thirds, but is slightly better than L two thirds. So, so for example, you can think about F and G as being an L four thirds. Uh, and the conclusion is that the bilinear ergodic averages converge almost everywhere. So Bourguin first proved this for bounded functions and Michael extended this all the way down to the same range that uh, the bilinear Hilbert transform is bounded in. Uh, but Michael did this in the early 2000s, and this result hasn't been strengthened uh, or really generalized, or it wasn't generalized till till uh, till COVID, basically. So in some sense, you know, Bourguin knew everything there was to know about bilinear ergodic averages uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, up to okay, this quantitative strengthening. Um, where you 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 go down below L1. But the long-term goal, uh, or my long-term goal, is to try to establish Walsh's theorem in the pointwise setting. So I'm, I'm not going to worry about the nilpotent case. I'll be interested in the case where I have commuting measure-preserving transformations. And what I'd like to do uh, is to prove that for every collection of polynomials with integer coefficients, any collection of bounded functions, any collection of measure commuting measure preserving transformations, uh, whenever you're on a probability space, these Chisaro averages converge almost everywhere. So again, the statement is that for almost every physical location, I can pick a value uh, P in my set X. If I evaluate all of these averages at that point P, I get a sequence of numbers. And what I'd like to show is that for almost every physical location P, this sequence of numbers converges. So Walsh said that if I squint at these averages, I view them as vectors, I, I have this type of convergence, or alternatively, I can find pointwise convergence along a subsequence. What I wanna do is I wanna show that I have pointwise convergence uh, along the full sequence. And in 2020, uh, we made some, I made some progress on this joint with Marish Merrick and Terry Tao. So this is the state of the art. Uh, or in 2020 it was. So the statement is that suppose I have a polynomial of degree at least two, and I form these bilinear ergodic averages. So when P is linear, this is what Borgain and Michael did. Uh, so we're thinking about P as being a degree at least two. Now, suppose that F and G are two functions that are just a little bit better than integrable. And so their product, it will maps a little bit below L1. So you can think about F and G is being two functions that are a little bit uh, spikier than L2. And the conclusion is that the bilinear ergodic averages converge almost everywhere. So, you know, if you think about P as being uh, N squared, then this is the pointwise analog of Furstenberg Weiss, um, but we can handle a uh, slightly greater generality. Um, but for the rest of this talk, I'm just gonna focus on the case where P is the quadratic, is this the squares. P of n is n squared. And we're gonna think about F and G as being an L2. And this, this was you know, how we started this, this problem. Uh, and it really captures most of the, the essential difficulty in this theorem. So to sort of put this result in perspective compared to Furstenberg Weiss, um, I'm gonna present a combinatorial consequence, sort of a Ramsey theory corollary. So suppose, you know, that I, I took a subset of the first n integers that's random with density delta. Then from any point x and e, we sort of, we sort of expect e to behave randomly uh, with respect to sampling along the parabola in the sense that, okay, if e is truly random, we expect the event that x minus n and x minus n squared are both in your set to, to factor as a product. So what we expect is that the, average number of incidences for, for any X and E, the average number of times that X minus N and X minus N squared are in E is like delta squared, if E were, were, were truly random. Now there's no reason uh, that a general set of density delta should, could be random. For instance, you could, you could concentrate in some, entirely inside of uh, some coset. Um, but the conclusion is using this, this pointwise ergodic theorem, that uh, once we rule out this one arithmetic obstruction, 
general sets of positive upper density uh, do essentially behave randomly with respect to sampling along the proud line. And this is what I mean. So suppose I start with a subset that's fairly large, upper density delta. Well, Furstenberg-Weiss, if we if we apply the the, the Furstenberg transference principle to to the Furstenberg-Weiss theorem, then we deduce infinitely many nonlinear arithmetic progressions. Um, but we can actually localize this result. So here's the statement. Um, for any very, very small epsilon, much less than this density, I can find a single Q depending on delta and maybe epsilon, so that for every sufficiently large scale, I can find a single vantage point, X, R, and E, so that the percentage of time, not that X, R minus N, X, R minus N squared is an E, but if I restrict to this arithmetic progression, uh, the percentage of time that X, R minus Q, N, and X, R minus Q squared, N squared is an E. Well, it's not delta squared. It's not exactly random, but it's nearly random. Moreover, this percentage bound holds for every single scale uh, between lambda, well, every sufficiently large scale uh, up to R. So in other words, you give me any, any number of, you give me any collection of scales that you're interested in studying. So you can imagine uh, looking at a subset inside of a very large box. And the conclusion is that if I restrict to an appropriate coset, I can find a single physical location um, outside of, or at which this type of product uh, holds in, in, in a very close sense. Does that make sense? They're single, they're, they're physical locations that, that force tons and tons and tons of, of nonlinear progressions all at once. So this, the statement about nonlinear arithmetic progressions is it's essentially local. You can find single XRs for which you have many uh, progressions uh, emanating from this point XR. So I hope that this gives sort of a sense of, you know, the, the relative strength of this theorem compared to, to Furstenberg vibes. Um, so before I, I really warm up and talk about what, what I did with Terry and Mariusz, I'm gonna sort of focus on two warm up cases where one of the two functions that we're studying is constant. So if I look at this bilinear average and I specialize my second function to be the identity, Again, we're on a probability space. So this identity function is, is totally integrable. It's very, very friendly. Uh, then I get the Cesaro averages that we've discussed previously. And if I set my first function to be constant, then I get these polynomial ergodic averages uh, that were first studied by Bourgain in the late 80s and early 90s. So I'm gonna talk about how we handle these two examples that'll sort of build up a toolkit. And then I'll explain uh, how to go from these examples to, to the, the full statement, the full, uh, the full theorem. Okay, so one function, uh, if we specialize these, these BNs to a single function, then, then we get the following two pointwise convergence results. So again, Birkhoff's theorem, uh, we get convergence of these Cesaro averages almost everywhere. And then in the late 80s and early 90s, Bourgain proved that the quadratic averages converge almost everywhere as well. So I want to talk a little bit about how Bourgain proved these results. Um, and the first thing I need to do is I, I need to try to quantify pointwise convergence. I'm going to switch perspectives, and I'm going to view pointwise convergence from a quantitative perspective. So this is, this is sort of strange, because we think about pointwise convergence as being qualitative. There's no, there's no rate. There's no universal rate of convergence. Convergence is sort of a soft statement. Um, but we can sort of quantify this using uh, jump counting data. So the following two statements I claim are, are equivalent. Um, AN converges, the sequence AN converges. And uh, for almost, for, for, for every time, every altitude T bigger than zero, there are finitely many times so that successive terms uh, in my subsequence hop by at least T. And if we want to quantify this, um, I'm going to let nt of the sequence denote the largest, uh, the length of the largest subsequence 
uh, so that I can find T consecutive jumps. So the statement that NT of AN is K uh, means that there are no subsequences of length K plus two so that I jump uh, by at least T along the subsequence, but I can find some subsequence of length K. So this measures the maximal number of times I jump. And the statement that uh, a sequence of functions converge uh, is equivalent to the almost everywhere convergence of the function that picks a physical location, evaluates all of these functions at that physical location, and then one measures the, the jump counting function or the jump counting uh, function of that sequence. So what Borgain wanted to do, he wanted to say that for, for Fn, these Chisaro averages, uh, almost surely in X, this jump counting function is finite valued. And to do this, the, the plan was to prove a norm estimate in some capacity. That if I start with a function that's nice and controlled, uh, there's some way to measure the norm of, of these jump counting functions, uh, which, which forces uh, convergence almost everywhere. And this is the technique that, that appears in Martingale theory. So motivated by the Martingale perspective, the natural, the natural estimate uh, is the following. So what we'd like to show is that in an L2 average sense, the number of times that the sequence of Chisaro averages or, or quadratic averages hops by T uh, scales like T to the negative R. So there's some polynomial growth. So, Again, convergence is equivalent to the statement that this jump counting function is finite valued almost everywhere. Motivated by the Martingale approach, our plan is gonna actually to, to be to quantify this and to try to prove uh, a polynomial rate of, of, of growth. So more formally for, for every, what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to exhibit some finite valued R so that we have this type of norm bound which forces uh, this jump counting function to be finite valued almost everywhere. And this is what Borgain did. He proved that for each R bigger than two uh, and every T bigger than zero, we can bound this type of jump counting function by the initial data. And in grad school, uh, I extended this to, this, to, to the case of the squares. Now, Borgain, Borgain knew this result, my, my result. I just don't think he bothered writing it down. Um, and in, in some sense, this, this jump counting estimate is sort of implicit in his work. I, I think in fact, in a, in a different paper, uh, he sort of says, he sort of says that uh, a jump counting estimate is available. Um, but if we sort of come to a scheme, uh, you might be a little bit confused or a little bit frightened because I haven't told you uh, anything about this, this, these measure preserving systems X. So I haven't offered topological structure. I haven't offered metric structure. I haven't offered norm structure. All I've said is that X is a measure preserving system. And I'm trying to prove some type of abstract estimate that holds uniformly in all of these measure preserving systems. So you can imagine this becoming uh, potentially subtle. But there's this, this lovely principle of Calderon that says that uh, you study Z actions on Z. So uh, if you sort of consider sequences of the form, you, you freeze some base point X and you look at sequences that send the, the point N and Z to TN acting on F of X. So you, you evaluate, you, you, you apply the transformation T N times to X and then evaluate. This gives you a sequence space function. And if you sort of uh, average this type of argument appropriately, you can reduce uh, this abstract estimate to a single concrete estimate. And what do I mean by this? Uh, if you replace X with, with the integers, if you replace the transformation with the shift, this jump counting estimate is equivalent uh, to this estimate at the top of the screen. And what Calvin says is that if we can prove this type of jump counting estimate, on the integers, then we can transfer this back to the measure preserving setting. So even though this estimate is only proven for one particular class of examples, by, by using this argument of Calderon, we can deduce the general situation. And, and similarly for the case of the squares. So just to summarize, 
we've turned a problem in pointwise ergodic theory or a dynamical problem into a problem involving a discrete harmonic analytic estimate. So how did we do this? We started with a question in the dynamical system setting. We recast conversions, quantified it, and reduced matters to showing that a certain jump counting function uh, converged almost everywhere. We plan to prove this convergence almost everywhere by proving that it satisfied a norm estimate. And then at last, we transferred this norm estimate to the sequence by setting of, of L2 of Z. So this method is very, very robust, and it really reduces questions about dynamical systems involving Z actions uh, to proving estimates in involving harmonic analytic operators uh, on the integers. So that's the scheme that Bourgain invented. Uh, and this is, this is how, how we're gonna handle uh, the, the remaining pointwise ergodic theory problems. So for the rest of the talk, until I say otherwise, you can really just focus on uh, L2Z functions. So sequences that are square summable. Uh, and that's gonna be the, the focus for the, for the remainder of the talk. So suppose you're trying to prove this type of jump counting estimate. Well, if I formally smooth out this sum, replace my discrete variable by a continuous variable, I arrive at this Euclidean problem. And using the fact that the trace of, of n, the full z orbit, plus a unit interval is equivalent to the trace of t, the continuous variable for t uh, in, in the positive reals, we can sort of transfer uh, the first estimate to the second statement and use real variable theory, um, Martingale methods and Fourier analysis. So this, this real variable theory uh, was known by, known by probabilists for, for decades. And uh, by exploiting linearity, we can deduce the discrete setting uh, from the continuous one. But if we try to do this for the squares, we, 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 uh, we run into a geometric issue. And what the, the issue is that the orbit of the squares from the perspective of density is half dimensional in the sense that if I intersect this orbit with any interval, I capture about half the number of points in, or the square root of the number of the points of the interval. And similarly, if I take this orbit, add it to the unit interval, I take the Minkowski sum and intersect with another interval that's sort of large, I grow uh, half dimensionally as well. And you compare this to the, the continuous setting where the trace of T squared is full dimensional. So what this means in terms of the expected difficulty of the problem is that understanding these averages is gonna be closer to understanding uh, circular averages, averages inside of the plane. So inside of R2, we have a two dimensional space. If we average over circles, we're taking one dimensional averages. So this forms sort of a half dimensional average. And what this sort of dimensional analysis says is that understanding these averages and the oscillation along the squares is gonna be closer in difficulty level to understanding averages and oscillations along the circular averages than, than Hardy Littlewood, the full dimensional setting. So right off the bat, this problem becomes much, much harder. Now, just to, to contrast with the Euclidean situation, if we're gonna try to prove the analogous real variable estimate, so what do I mean by that? I smooth out my sum, I replace my, my sum in n with an integral in y, I replace the discrete time n squared with the continuous time y squared, and by changing variables, I can reduce back to the linear situation. But I can't implement this trick on the integers because there's a smallest scale. There's no way to infinitesimally reprice uh, R to allow a change of variables because there's no infinitesimal uh, on the integers. So these geometric issues say that we have to try something different, um, but we're after an LQ estimate. So it makes sense to try to use the Fourier transform. And uh, what we can do is we can express these averaging operators uh, in terms of convolution operators. 
So um, below delta n squared is the point mass at, at n squared. So delta n squared of x is one when x is n squared and it's zero otherwise. Um, if we compute the Fourier transform of these averages, we get this type of exponential sum. And I can view these type of averages uh, in terms of Fourier multipliers. I, I take the Fourier transform of my function, I multiply it by this exponential sum, and then I invert. So again, this is sort of a natural perspective. We're interested in L2 behavior. We know how the Fourier transform intertwines convolution and, and multiplication. And the hope is that if we really, really, really understand these multipliers, maybe there's some hope of understanding uh, these averaging operators. Now, in the linear setting, if I replace this n squared with an n, so I replace this, this n squared in the definition of k n hat with an n, we can fully understand this multiplier uh, in terms of the distance from beta to, to zero mod, mod one. And how do you see this? Well, this is a geometric series. It sums to something like uh, one over n mod beta, uh, and which tells us that when beta is, is much bigger than one over n, this multiplier tries very hard to be zero. And when beta is much smaller than one over n, uh, you can tailor expand this phase and you see that this multiplier is trying very hard to be one. So this multiplier can be completely understood just in terms of the magnitude of, of beta, the distance from beta to zero. On the other hand, this quadratic multiplier is much more subtle. It's, it's a Gauss sum and requires uh, analytic number theory to really understand. So in particular, uh, to get your hands on this multiplier, uh, you need to use the hardy littlewood circle method, uh, which was invented to solve, uh, to study Waring's problem. So the way I think about these is sort of probabilistically. So what do I mean by that? Well, each multiplier, is an average of n pairwise independent mean zero random variables. So if we believe probability theory, we might expect some type of power savings. You know, if, if these random variables were fully independent, you might expect, you know, a square root savings. We're not necessarily fully independent. We're pairwise independent. Uh, so we expect maybe some small gain. But there's an obstruction that's easiest seen uh, just by computing a single, single example. In particular, if I specialize beta to be a third, uh, and I start adding up, well, when n is one, n squared is one, e to the negative two pi, one third, I capture. When n is two, n squared is four, four thirds is one third mod one. So I add a another copy of e to the negative two pi over three. And when n is three, Three squared is nine, nine over three is zero mod one. So I get a contribution of one. Now when n is four, four is one mod three. And I, I, I repeat this reasoning. And if I, if I keep you know, appealing to periodicity, I see that this formal sum of n terms collapses uh, to a sum of three terms, which, which doesn't decay in n. So we can't really expect this power savings in general. Uh, but it turns out that this is really the only type of obstruction. So after uh, some elementary but non-trivial uh, analytic number theoretic methods, you arrive at this type of distinction. Um, whenever beta is like one third, or more generally, it's n close to a rational with uh, an n small denominator. We say beta lives in an n major R, and we have to understand this multiplier. It's interesting. But otherwise, this probabilistic intuition kicks in. So we have this multiplier, we ask one of two things. Uh, can we use this probabilistic intuition? And if we can, we ignore it. If we can't, well, this forces beta to be very close to a rational with a very small denominator, uh, like one third. So if we, if we translate this, this information from Fourier space back to, back to physical space, uh, we see that we, we arrive at a particular class of examples that we really need to understand. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the L1 normalized indicator of a number of, of the interval of length Q to the hundred, where we think of Q as being like one over a thousand of, of N, N to the one over a thousand. And I weight these by these so-called Ramanujan sums. So if I summed over all A and Q, all, all A less than Q, uh, this would give me Q times the indicator function of Q mod Z, 
I'm not summing over all the A's, I'm only summing over the co-prime A's, uh, and I, I arrive at these Ramanujan sums. And what I do is I take these L1 normalized averages and I weight them by the Ramanujan sums. And roughly speaking, what Borgain had to do was he had to estimate the jump counting function um, of these single scale averages, these convolution operators applied to superpositions of these Ramanujan sums. So I take a bunch of denominators of a single size. I average my, my function uh, along these, these, these chi Qs. And I wanna estimate the jump counting function uh, as efficiently as possible. So I really don't wanna use the triangle inequality. So again, uh, if we let FQ denote these weighted averages by Ramanujan sums, then we have a uniform estimate that for every n sufficiently large, the L2 norm of these averages decays like a square root. So we have a uniform estimate and we wanna arrive at some type of uh, simultaneous estimate. I wanna show that in general, uh, these averages sort of adhere to each other. They become quite sticky. We can control them all at once. So there are not that many ways to do this. Uh, so this estimate looks, very, very difficult. Uh, it says that if I introduce this jump counting function, then I only have to pay another logarithm in Q. Uh, going from the single scale estimate to the multi-scale jump counting estimate only costs you a log in Q. And I should say that the implicit constant in R blows up like R over R minus two. So there's, there's some loss if I, as I choose R to be closer and closer to two, uh, I get some blow up. Uh, but, but this really is, is very, very surprising. Um, so Bourgain first proved this result with a log squared. His result holds in great generality, uh, but then Michael improved this to a single power of log. And this doesn't affect the argument. The, for, for our purposes, all you need is the fact that this loss is, is less than Q to the half. Um, but if I were to replace uh, the squares with the D monomials, I'd replace this power of one over two with essentially one over D. So if I wanna implement this type of reasoning in, in full generality, I really need a uh, sub polynomial loss in Q. So this log squared or this log uh, in some sense is almost necessary. Um, so Michael proved this by using Hilbert space techniques uh, and exploited periodicity, but uh, when Bourguin did this, he, he required uh, some really fancy uh, chaining arguments from, from probability theory and bonic space geometry. So the statement looks harmonic analytic, uh, but it's proven using bonic space techniques, in fact. It's, it's really quite surprising. And it, Bourguin's uh, work, which is, you know, holds for holds in sort of greater generality, uh, had applications in many problems in time frequency analysis. Uh, as well. It's really very, very robust and very surprising. But what does this mean? Uh, we now have sort of a scheme when we're interested in proving pointwise convergence uh, along linear averages. So we transfer the problem to a quantitative estimate involving convolution or averaging operators on the integers. We use the Fourier transform to sort of extract the analytic heart of these averaging operators. And then we estimate the jump counting function. And now you can do this in general on other LP spaces. But the advantage to working on L2 is that we have Plancherel's theorem that allows us to quantify all of our, our heuristic approximations very accurately. So if we're trying to, to prove this bilinear statement, uh, we, we do the same moves that Borgain makes. We wanna prove jump counting estimates uh, on the sequence of bilinear averages. So the problem is that in the bilinear setting, we don't have Plancherel to help us. And essentially this was the, the major difficulty in getting started. But uh, in 2019, uh, at the end of 2019, Terry uh, showed me this, this inverse theorem of uh, Sarah Palouse and Sean Prendable. And what it says is if I take two bounded functions, uh, one bounded function supported on an interval of length n squared, the, the largest possible value that this L1 norm could take is like n squared, if, if both the functions are constant. 
Now, what this statement is saying is suppose that I'm not n squared, but suppose that I'm nearly n squared. Then the conclusion is that there's some uh, arithmetic regression with gap size that's very small compared to n and length that's very large compared to m. So m is nearly maximal. So that when I average, uh, when I sample my, I average my function along this arithmetic regression, uh, my L1 norm is nearly maximal. So what this is saying is that the only way that this bilinear average can be big is if I have a lot of arithmetic structure. I, I correlate with the L1 normalized indicator function of a very large arithmetic regression. And after uh, you know, some serious harmonic analysis, uh, maybe not so serious, after, after a little bit of work, um, you can express this in terms of Fourier coefficients. Um, if this average is large, then f hat has a lot of uh, L2 norm in a essentially one over n neighborhood of a cyclic subgroup with a small denominator. And similarly, g, um, with an n to the negative two neighborhood. So I'm shifting G quadratically. So you expect this quadratic, quadratic scaling. I'm shifting F linearly. I expect this linear scaling. And I'm only off by this, by this sort of uncertainty principle type scaling by this logarithmic factor. So we started with this and we developed an approximation argument uh, that quantified that previous slide that used uh, a bunch of different tools. So we use Ionescu Wenger multiplier theory, which was sort of a discrete Littlewood Paley theory uh, that was recently uh, refined by Terry. We used uh, Hanbon, the ha geometric Han Bonnock theorem uh, and uh, the Vinograd of mean value theorem. So these are tools from really three different, three different types of tools that we needed to, to turn this inverse theorem into this Fourier analytic statement. But if we, if we make these uh, approximations, then we see that we need to understand superpositions of these bilinear averages uh, where uh, FQ and GQ are, are types of functions that we've seen already, um, but they're at least common multiple uh, is small, it's, it has the same type of scaling. So in the Bourdain situation, we're looking at linear averages applied to fun single functions with this type of form. In the bilinear setting, uh, the conclusion of Blues' theory is that we need to understand bilinear interactions uh, with the same scaling. Now, this, again, with FQ given by this weighted average, um, if we use this discrete Littlewood Paley theory, Han Bonnock and Vinogradov, eventually we get this type of single scale estimate that if I estimate the contribution of these types of interactions with these types of weighted functions, then I get some small power savings according to the degree of rationality. So in the bilinear setting, we saw a power saving of Q to the negative, in the linear setting, we saw power savings of Q to the negative a half. Here we don't quite have q to the negative half, but there's some power savings that we uh, that we we enjoy, and this is this follows uh, from the plus prendable theory after really quite a lot of work. But roughly spe speaking, our challenge uh, became one of estimating these jump the jump counting function uh, corresponding to these averages, and what we proved analogous to Bourgain is that there's some constant c naught smaller than this C, but there's still some constant C naught so that we can estimate uh, this jump counting function efficiently. And the key additive combinatorial input that we needed uh, differently from Bourgain in the linear setting was, was a nonlinear Roth corollary in the cyclic subgroup setting. So the statement is this, suppose I have a density parameter delta and I choose a prime that's sufficiently large, delta to the negative a million, something like this. Uh, then the statement is for any Q that's a power of this prime, uh, if I take a subset of relative density inside of this inside of the cyclic subgroup Z mod Q, if my relative density is at least delta, then I contain a nonlinear arithmetic progression inside of the cyclic subgroup X, X minus N, X minus N squared. So this is like Furstenberg Weiss, uh, but in a in the cyclic subgroup setting, um, 
So this was the, the additive combinatorial result we needed. Um, but we also needed to combine these with, with martingale methods, further bonding space geometry methods, and finally some oscillatory integral techniques over the piatics, which was quite surprising. Um, we really needed to understand uh, the distribution of polynomials over the piatics. And this is almost suggested by the cyclic subgroup uh, statement, where I have to choose Q to be a very large power of P. And sort of what was interesting is that we had to combine uh, Fourier analytic arguments with sort of physical space arguments, which is different from uh, the way Bourguin did his, his work, where he, he really did everything in Fourier space. So I'm working on upgrading uh, this work uh, to the setting of higher degrees of multilinearity. Um, we expect to be able to handle uh, commuting shifts involving polynomials of distinct degrees. So um, you give me M commuting transformations, M polynomials with distinct degrees that form these M-fold multilinear averages. And we'd like to show that these uh, converge almost everywhere. And uh, I just learned from Jim Wright uh, that we can handle the case uh, of a single transformation. And the sticking point was, was piatic analysis. So, you know, I, I personally cannot prove this result, um, but I, I, I think Jim, Jim has sorted out the details. Uh, we, we had the case where the PIs were distinct monomials uh, early this past year, uh, but passing from a distinct monomial setting to the piatic setting, or sorry, to the full distinct degree setting uh, required some heavy duty piatic analysis. So regarding polynomials of the same degrees, uh, the model problem is still bilinear in some sense. So Borgain proved that whenever I replace this square with a single linear shift, TNF1, T2NF2 converge. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to introduce this quadratic behavior. And solving this problem will likely require uh, additional inference from time frequency analysis and possibly uh, polynomial Freiman Ruja. It's, it's very challenging. Um, the open problem that I'm most focused on right now is the trilinear, trilinear formulation of Bourgain's work. So Bourgain proved pointwise convergence of these averages when F3 was not present. And I'd like to introduce this, this third function. Um, and I just, I've written here that this problem will, will require higher degree Fourier analysis. Um, perhaps not. I'm, I'm trying to to avoid using this, um, but it's, it's very, very challenging. And it's, it's closely linked uh, to the most famous open problem in time frequency analysis, uh, which involves estimating the trilinear Hilbert transform. And I'll stop there. So thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Yeah, any question from the online audience, please? Yes, a question. Uh, so I was thinking that instead of the mean average, do you have, uh, are there any results known for other kind of averages? Yeah, so that's a really good question. I just learned of, of uh, some questions by Bergelson. Um, so if instead of the measure preserving setting, you work uh, in a topological setting. So you, you say that you're only interested in, you're on a compact metric space um, and you're interested in, in evaluating uh, ergodic averages of continuous functions. And what Bergelson seemed to think was that if you look at even just linear polynomial ergodic averages or polynomial averages applied to single continuous functions, um, you can come up with you know, appropriate measure preserving topological uh, dynamical systems so that the set where you don't converge uh, is co-meager, that there's some continuous function, um, some compact metric space, some transformation, so that when you form, say, the averages along the squares, you can find a set, well, it's not, it's gonna have zero measure um, by Bourguin, but you can find a set that's co-meager. So it's it's huge in the sense of bare, 
along which you fail to have conversions. So I, I think this is really interesting because it, it points to a difference between you know, the almost sure world, the measure preserving setting and the topological world. Um, if you're interested in that problem, Vitaly told me that the place to look for a counterexample was uh, skew shifts. So you, you look at a, an action, let's say on the two torus that sends X comma Y to the point plus phi of X, where phi is some potentially even analytic function. Um, that's what Bergelson thought would, would do to, or I think that's what Bergelson thought would, would break this convergence statement. Um, he was also interested in asking about uh, non-convergence of bilinear averages, uh, again, in the topological setting. Um, these problems are completely new to me, so I don't really have any intuition, but I think it's very interesting that, you know, the measure preserving world and the and the topological world can can have very different conclusions that you can find you find big sets in the measure preserving setting where you have convergence but you can find big sets in the topological setting where you don't have convergence and and i find that really interesting but i, I have no ideas how to how to do those problems okay thank you uh, could you uh, say the name again or maybe type in the chat because i was not able to Oh, uh, oh, shoot. Uh, just give me a second. Okay, so Vitaly Bergelson uh, wanted us to prove that uh, point that the pointwise conversions of polynomial ergodic averages applied to continuous functions on compact measure spaces in general fails on co-meager sets. That's the statement. So co-meager is like full measure in some sense from the perspective of Bayer that there's a you know, a nowhere dense set where you have convergence maybe, but in general, like away from this nowhere dense set, you don't have convergence. So this really is a very different statement than the measure preserving measure preserving statements setting, right? You're, you're, if you apply the, if you, if you view this topological setting from the measure preserving perspective, the conclusion is that, you know, almost everywhere, this ergodic averages converge. But what Bergelson said is that there should be some system where even though you have almost everywhere convergence, uh, this convergence set is nowhere dense. And I think that's very surprising. You have full measure nowhere dense sets where you have uh, where you have convergence. And I, I you know, I, I, I'm not um, very good at point set topology. So I have really no, no idea about what a full measure nowhere dense set looks like. You can imagine some type of Cantor set maybe. Uh, and that's very, very cool that, you know, this, 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 uh, this behavior is confined to very strange Cantor sets. I, I think that's very interesting, but again, I just learned about these problems and I, I have no idea about how to approach them. Yeah. So, uh, hi, Heaven. Uh, thank you for the good talk. Uh, so I had just uh, some questions about this bilinear uh, averages. Yeah. So when you have like uh, different polynomials, uh, what are the LP estimates uh, available for these bilinear operators? I so, think you're talking about mostly about the pointwise convergences. Yeah, we map below L1. Yeah. That um, whenever F and G are in L1 plus epsilon and their product is in you know, L1 minus a bit, you have pointwise convergence. Um, I don't know how close to, I mean, in the Euclidean setting, you have pointwise convergence down to D minus one over D, uh, where D is this degree of the polynomial. That's way too good to hope for uh, in the, in the polynomial setting, but at the very least, it shows you that as the degree of the polynomial increases, you have to get closer to L1. Uh, 
All right, all right. And, and is this uh, like done in the continuous setting and then some transference works here or how does it? No, 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 no. Because there's this, this geometric issue presents that if you look at the trace of, of a polynomial orbit inside of R, you know, you trace out some type of continuous continuous shape. You know, you, you get some type of infinite ray. If you just look at the, the image of a polynomial on R plus, whereas if you look at the image of a polynomial on Z, you get a lower dimensional set. So if you're thinking about this sort of abstractly, this is like trying to understand uh, averages uh, along lower dimensional measures in, inside of Euclidean space. And indeed, this is the, a motivating problem. If you want to start thinking about these bilinear averages um, or trilinear averages, this is a... I'm going to put in a chat in the chat a problem that uh, I can't do. I, you know, I should be able to do, uh, but I I have no idea. So I, I've written down a trilinear average, and what I can do is I can prove that as R gets big, uh, I have a jump counting estimate that uh, if I only restrict to R bigger than a hundred, I can prove a jump counting estimate on this. But I don't even know if R gets small, whether or not these averages converge, right? Uh -huh. you, what you'd like to prove is, is that as R gets small, these averages converge to the product, but I don't know how to do that. In the bilinear setting, we do know how to do that, but uh -huh. nobody knows how to do this in the trilinear setting. And this is highly frustrating. And the, there's a geometric issue here. Um, for large scales, um, when R is big, your scaling grows like R cubed. Um, it's the degree of the, the highest degree polynomial tells you your spatial scale. And this sort of allows you to use um, techniques from ergodic theory, um, like pet induction. Um, but when R is small, your spatial scale is, just, is determined by your order of vanishing, which is linear. So your cubic is now moving in a very, very, very small interval while your linear term is varying over a big one. Yeah. So this degree reduction from ergodic theory is not the right tool. Um, so I, I'd, I mean, I'd love to solve this. Uh, I just don't know how to do it. Okay, okay. And, and one more thing, I mean, this always, uh, because I mean, uh, here we take average like x minus n and then x minus n square. Can we also take instead of n square some fractional power, which is small? Yes, amazing question. This is too good of a question, in fact, because this is my graduate student's thesis project. <laughs> he's, he's doing, a, so oh. this is, I'll, I'll, I'll share what he's doing and I'll share some some extensions that I think he, that, that I want somebody to do. Uh, okay. Uh, so he's uh, handling right now uh, pointwise convergence of multilinear ergodic averages along floors of fractional monomials. So he has this result when all the CIs are rational. Um, we expect all reals. And then, you know, okay, fine. If you want to be technical, you can imagine multiplying these fractional monomials by sort of slowly varying functions. Okay, this isn't so surprising. But here's an open problem that I don't know how to do. I think it has to do, it has to do with, you know, the failure, this, this logarithmic loss in Chernoff's inequality. The Chernoff's inequality, if you want to prove, if you want to apply Chernoff's inequality and borel cantelli you, you typically have to give up a square root logarithm more than your variance. So here's the problem. Okay, so, yeah. So choose a, a sequence of hitting times uh, of Bernoulli random variables with density like the squares. So how do you do this? Uh, I let Xn denote a sequence of Bernoulli random variables 
with expectations like n to the negative a half, then the nth hitting time is going to be like n squared up to some constant. And I would love to know Okay. I'd love to know whether or not these averages converge almost surely. Now, convergence is a tail event. So there's a zero one law available. So if you can even just give me a positive measure set where I have convergence, you have the almost sure statement, right? But I, I can't even do that. I can't even find a, I can't even find a positive measure set where, where I have convergence. Um, with but 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 if I if I replace this n to the negative a half with n to the epsilon minus a half, I can do it. So okay. this is a very subtle question. Uh, and roughly speaking, the additive combinatorial issue is that if I look at my sequence of hitting times a n inside of the first n integers, they're about n to the half many points. So if I look at the different set of a n with itself. This is going to have size about n, which means this different set is going to cover the first n integers by about one time. So if I try to apply Chernoff, I'm centering, I'm losing a log n to the half around one. On the other hand, if if, a, if my hitting times, if my expectation is like n to the epsilon minus a half, my hitting times will grow like n to the two minus epsilon, a different set of a set of size n to the uh half plus delta is going to have size n to the n to the one plus two delta, which means I'm going to cover my interval about n to the two delta many times. And this log loss, log root log loss in Chernoff doesn't change anything. Okay. So this is a very delicate question. I think it's, you know, if you, if you sort of, you know, I, I'm not going to say it's as hard as the lambda p problem, but it's one of these where Chernoff just messes you up and you can't use it. You have to get around it some way. Um, I think this is related to point-wise convergence. Of these averages, the linear setting when F is in L1. Yeah. And this is a problem that I've been thinking about for 11 years. I just don't know how to solve. Um, I'd love to, I, I would, I really want to know the answer. Uh, and again, this is this is interesting because if you increase the density, if you increase the expectation of xn even slightly, so you decrease the growth rate of an from n squared to n to the two minus epsilon, you do almost surely have a convergence result. If you replace an this random sequence with the deterministic sequence n squared, you don't have a convergence result. But if you replace this an omega with a particularly nice arithmetic sequence that grows like n squared, you do have a convergence result. So nobody knows what the truth is. If you take a sequence with density like the squares, do you or do you not have a convergence result for L1 functions? And I've tried this for 11 years. I just can't do it. Uh, but it's a, it's a very cool problem. Uh, you know, and it's, it's for, you know, even, even an Orlick space result would be amazing. If you could prove, you can prove pointwise convergence for L log L, but L root log L would be a huge breakthrough. Uh, yeah, so I, I'll take anything at this point. I just don't know how to do this problem. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any, any more questions? Yeah, from the online audience, if at all. Okay, so if there is no more questions, let's uh, thanks Ben Cross for a nice talk and wonderful interaction. Thank you. Thank you, guys.